So <clears throat> I'd be remiss if we didn't at least uh, give some preview of kind of the structure and content of this course. Um, so as I see it, we're basically going to have a couple different kinds of lectures and then there'll be assignments, you know, short assignments, not meant to be sort of onerous on the student, but just meant to sort of test understanding and then push people to go a little further in developing their own ideas and their own understanding. So that's going to come with each lecture. The way the way I see it, we have we have a few main kinds of lectures and a few main kinds of content that come up in the lectures. You know, in your lectures, Simon, I think you do a really good good job of kind of grounding what humanities analytics is doing in the sort of broader history of science and the broader history of the humanities. I think that comes through a lot. Um, in some of my lectures, what I'm trying to do more is think uh, philosophically and epistemologically about some of the tools that get used in um, the digital humanities. So things like probability, pattern recognition, things like that. I, I think your stuff gets very is very good on the kind of historical genealogy of these tools. I'm coming in a bit more with sort of how, how should we understand these tools sort of generally and from first principles as tools for sort of um, learning and building justified beliefs about our subject matter. Um, we've got the guest lectures, which we've talked about a lot. The guest lectures are really there for inspiration. Um, and then finally, we have um, applications-based lectures where we actually take you through in some level of detail uh, digital humanities projects um, where it, wherein we're going to sort of show you how we deploy these tools um, to hopefully generate some new insights. Um, so yeah, so, so, so is that, yeah. they are, no, they are, they are, they are, we just got to be a little humble, but that's, yeah, go on, is, is that a fair summary you think of what, of what we've done? No, I think, I think it is, I mean, yeah. um, you know, I, I, I would not, I, I, I would say that the genealogies we give of the sciences and the humanities are pragmatic genealogies. Good. Yeah. Meaning, um, you know, sort of one of my goals is to speak to people coming from STEM uh, to help them make sense of the ways in which humanities scholars try to get things done, right? Good. So a, a key thing, scientists usually tend to think of theories, you know, battling to the death in some, you know, pauperian arena. Um, people in the humanities are much more comfortable with uh, interpretations that may compete, may contradict each other, and yet can sort of coexist, right? So there's there's something um, uh, that somebody in STEM, for example, I think really needs to get a handle on, which is that very rarely are you disproving uh, a chunk of humanities scholarship. Um, at the same time, uh, my hope is that uh, just speaking as a scientist, somebody who, you know, whose personal genealogy was uh, was in the sciences, um, someone uh, helping someone in the humanities figure out, you know, what are the myths and the folk tales I'm sitting around with that are sitting around in my head when we start working together. Um, there's a collaborative aspect here that's collaborative between the scientists and people in the humanities that uh, is it's a. I'm not a two cultures person. I don't think you are either. I mean, this yeah. is something that always comes up with with uh, when we talk about this work. Uh, but there's certainly the ways in which we think we've gotten the answer and what the kind of answer we want is. Those are uh, those are questions that everyone needs to wrestle with. I think that's I think that's exactly right. I think that's exactly right. And I think um, your lectures in particular, you brought up the folk tales. I think um, students will see that in week one, and I think that's a really nice way of introducing this sort of idea of these different different cultures of the humanities and the sciences but at the same time sort of finding ways of reconciling them that I think are very interesting. Um, yeah. The last thing I wanted to bring up is you know it is foundations and applications of humanities analytics um, and we've been talking I think in a lot of ways about the foundations. I've mentioned the applications but I just wanted to touch on those a little more. I think there's two two things to say about the way we approach applications in this course. Um, the first of which is, you know, as the name digital humanities, we prefer humanities analytics, but as the name digital humanities, which one sees a lot, um, suggests there is a component to this that is about computation, right? We're sort of using computational resources to try and study human cultural output. But of course, the, the, the primary computational resource that we're, own familiar, we're all familiar with is our own brains, right? And so that's the first thing we do in this course is sort of show how, perhaps a, a human laptop interface can already start doing digital humanities, right? Whether it's typing something into a search bar or count and counting, 
you can already get a humanities analytics project kind of started up in that way. And there, and both assignments and lectures sort of take people through the process of doing that. We will get a little more technical in later lectures in terms of um, leaning on our computational resources a little more in order to do some analysis and we'll talk students through that. But at the same time, it's worth emphasizing that what this isn't is a Python tutorial, right? Um, right. I, don't, I, that, I, don't even, I don't even know Python, David. So, <laughs> know Python. So, so it's not a Python tutorial, it's not an R tutorial. Um, and our, our thinking there is, you know, there are other great places where students can go um, for that. Uh, we're, yeah. we're, we're trying to start a little bit more from first principles and get people up to that epistemological place so that they're not just sort of plugging in their corpus into a pre-written Python script and sort of accepting whatever comes out, but rather starting from a place where they're actually going to design their own project, maybe be a little more flexible in their use of computational resources to do some more original work. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the key lessons of the first couple of lectures is you can get really, really far by counting, right? Yes. Um, you know, there's, um, you know, the, the real interest for me is not the technical fireworks. In fact, um, as time goes on, uh, the, the, the mathematical side of our work uh, has, you know, sort of decreased in sophistication, I think, as the insights have, have increased. Um, the, uh, you know, counting, right, counting, taking ratios, um, very simple visualizations are often all you need to get extraordinarily far. There's, I think there's a perception that, you know, you need to boot up um, a neural network, you need to boot up, uh, you know, the latest thing off of Google, uh, off of Facebook's PyTorch. Um, I don't think that's the case. Um, you know, if, if you want to run that far, you can absolutely run that far. But running theme of this course is uh, making sense of the outputs of whatever you're doing. We want to empower people to, you know, design every part of that, of that um, scholarly process themselves, which is why we focus on um, literally things like counting, um, talking in terms of probabilities, uh, talking in terms of very simple graphs that one can make. Uh, you know, the first couple assignments are things that you can do without any machine whatsoever. They're yes. simply tallying things up. And that's one of the that's one of the stories we're really keen to get across is how much you can learn, uh, how much interesting scholarship you can get out the other side simply by paying attention in a, in a with a slightly different, let's say, epistemic stance. I think that's right. I think that's right. And then just you know, at the risk of being sort of slightly out over my skis and maybe seeming a little arrogant, you know, I also think, <laughs> um, at, at least in the ways in which sort of things like probability are introduced in this course. Um, they're actually going to be introduced with it with a level of sort of first principles kind of rigor that's a that, that that is hard to find in a science textbook right scientists can be very pragmatic and so things like probability are often introduced in a way that um sort of glosses over what i think are very important sort of first logical steps and really understanding the concepts and so sort of to tie things back together you know you said why why a philosopher of science to teach this course I think there's something to the idea that actually by starting from the logic of statistical concepts, rather than just deploying them, someone as a humanities scholar is going to then be in the position to actually apply these concepts, not just to what the scientists have thought are the interesting applications, to what, but to what they, the humanists, think are the interesting applications. And to have that flexibility, you kind of need that um, that sort of first principles kind of understanding of these things, which can be done very simply. It's not, it's not sort of um, very, it's not mathematically difficult at all. Again, it sort of comes down to counting in some sense, but it's off, it's going to be presented here in a different way than one might find in, say, a physics textbook. Yeah, I think that's that's right. Uh, one of the, you know, one of the things that I've been um, uh, keen to kind of get across is that any kind of process, whether that's going through an archive, reading, uh, or counting, estimating probabilities, right? All of these are forms of, of storytelling. They're ways of, of representing thinking. There's nothing magical about mathematics um, over and above, let's say, reasoning, philosophically reasoning, historically. Um, in each of these cases, there's not this, you know, we're, 
one of the terms that comes up a lot for us is this idea of empowering people. We don't want there to be a black box in between the text and the conclusion. That's something that I don't think has served uh, 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 any of these fields very well. Um, what we want is people to sort of open this box, realize that most of the stuff in this box actually, you know, it's integer, right? It's counting, it's not that bad. Um, and, uh, you know, taking people very slowly through the actual story that's being told uh, inside that quantitative moment. I think that's, that's a great way to put it. And I think um, I'll let that sort of be the last word that, you know, storytelling is at the heart of everything we're doing in this course, both in the sort of content of our subject matter, whether it's historical stories or fictional stories, um, but then also these sort of epistemological stories, the sort of story of how one gets from the kind of raw data of this sort of massive world of human cultural output. Um, and even, you know, we're focusing almost exclusively on text in this course, even just the amount of human textual output is so vast, and telling the story of how one gets from that to an understanding of humanity through interaction with those texts is really at the core of what we're trying to impart here. Um, so yeah, so I think you know it's it's always great to talk to you, Simon. Um, and I really <laughs> and I really hope that um, you know this 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 encourages people to take the course and to stick with it and to think that they can get something out of it because we've worked really hard putting it together. We've been very lucky to get the generous funding of the National Endowment for the Humanities and to have resources at our disposal between Carnegie Mellon and the Santa Fe Institute in order to make that all possible. So I'll conclude there and just hope that if you're listening to this, that this discussion between me and Simon, the two main lecturers on this course has encouraged you to sort of pursue the course further. Well, thanks very much, David. Thank you.